Welcome to the Healthy Family Project Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda. I'm a mom of two and passionate about bringing parents and caregivers useful and digestible information to help make this journey just a little easier, more fun, and of course, with some laughs. I love digging deep into topics and sharing my own struggles and successes with our listeners. I can't wait to share this journey with you. Welcome to the Healthy Family Project Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda. Thank you for joining me today as I talk with Jeannie Riley. She is the Director of School Nutrition at the Wyndham and Raymond School Department. And if you're joining us for the first time, be sure to backtrack um, and listen to some of our previous episodes or watch if you're watching on YouTube. You can find all of our podcasts on your favorite podcasting site, or you can find us on YouTube. Uh, okay, so check on all of that. Some of our previous episodes, we're covering everything from easy meal plans to the mental health of our student athletes. So we talk about a wide range of of things, everything that it takes to make us a healthy family. So you can find Healthy Family Project on all of the social media outlets out there. We're just about everywhere. And then you can also visit us on healthyfamilyproject.com. We have more than 600 dietitian approved recipes and inspiration, all family friendly, delicious. I can vouch for it. So uh, today I am excited to be talking to Jeannie and to learn more about what today's school lunch looks like. It's changed a lot since some of us were, were back buying school lunch back in the day and really what families can do to find out more about what their school offers, uh, what the menu looks like, how to maybe get more involved. Uh, just some some tips from Jeannie. I think you guys are really going to love this conversation today. So let's get started. Let's debunk that myth of school lunches. We're not just talking turkey supreme and square pizzas. Let's get started. Welcome, Jeannie. It's so wonderful to have you with us today. Before we jump in, can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Oh, great. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. I've been a, a follower of um, your Facebook page and on social media of the Healthy Family Project for so many years, and I often share it on my um, district's social channels, you know, some of your great ideas and stuff like that. So it's a real honor to be here. I am a mother of three adult children and a grandmother of six grandchildren oh. that um, keep me super busy. Yes. Um, and I love spending time with my family and vacationing together and cooking together and adventuring together um, whenever we can. I during the pandemic, one of the things we did with our grandchildren because we couldn't get together with them was to cook with them online. So, That's you know, cool. we saw a lot of these great, you know, like you could sign up and, and have them learn to cook, but both my husband and I are out of the food industry um, or the food and nutrition industry. So we decided to, well, we could pay for them to have a subscription to a cooking thing, but what better way to really connect with them is to have little zoom lessons. So what we would pick a recipe and send them a shopping list, and then we would do the same thing and we would cook together on zoom. Um, so we love to cook with our grandchildren and with our families and spend time. I'm also a caregiver to my mother who will be a hundred years old in December. Wow. So you're on <laughs> yeah. all sides. You have so, a lot of, yes, the... <laughs> I am. I am like the shining example of somebody from the sandwich generation Yes, so, say, helping, you know, helping to care for grandchildren, but also caring for my mother who is, um, lives with us and is very well, um, and will be a hundred in December. Wow. I have worked in so many aspects of the food and nutrition industry from working in restaurants to working for the WIC program to working in the clinical side and hospitals as dietetic technician. Um, but I really feel like I, oh, and long-term care. I've worked in long-term care, um, you know, managing the food and nutrition departments and a long-term care facilities. But I really feel like I found my true niche when I moved into school nutrition. I just feel like I really found my home. I feel like the work that I do has great impact, um, not just for the children that we serve, but also for their families, because we as a department really feel um, that it's our role to educate children and families about healthy eatings. And we're always providing recipes and um 
nutrition facts and things like that so that families can take what their children are learning at school and incorporate that into their um, menus and their cooking at home. So, you know, I really feel like this is where I belong and this is where um, I feel like my greatest impact has been. And I really love school nutrition. And for anybody who's listening, who's um, starting out in the food and nutrition industry as a dietitian or as a dietetic technician, I think it's really a great field to try it out, do an internship in a um, school nutrition program to see where your impact might be there. That's amazing. I I feel like me, like many of our guests on the show, the impact side and the journey of where you land always just warms my heart to see that, you know, there's so many people that have, you know, in a world that's so chaotic and so many different things going on and you are, a, you know, able to find that place where you can do good, but also, you know, be have a career in that. It's just such an amazing, amazing I think thing. That's what I really love about school nutrition is you can just make your focus in school nutrition about feeding children, but we've chosen in our district to make it more than just feeding children because, you know, the schools don't have like cooking classes very much anymore. And this, that stopped years ago. So many of our parents of our youngest children, they're, they are not very, um, knowledgeable about what to do with, for instance, a cauliflower or a, a jicama, or you know how to prepare, how to how to take you know the skin off of a pineapple and prepare it for serving. Um, so we like to really help families be more knowledgeable about that. So if we're serving something like a roasted cauliflower on our lunch menu, we can provide that recipe on our website or in a newsletter to families. And then families can also do it because the more children are exposed to um, foods that they're not necessarily familiar with, the more they will become familiar with it. Right. And the more they'll like them. And I have school board members telling me all the time or and parents emailing me, you know, my child would never eat asparagus or cauliflower or quinoa you know they they never wanted to eat that at home but once they start eating it at school there's this uh, special thing that happens when children are eating food with their peers that makes them a little less afraid a little more adventuresome um, whether we're serving it on the menu or whether we're cooking it in the classroom um, in a farm to school event but that makes children a little more open-minded and a little more willing to try things. And gradually they do learn that these are really delicious things. Well, you really make a good point. And I, I say this all the time that it has to go back to, to the house, to the family, mm-hmm. to the home. Yeah. Like it, ha- you have to, you can't expect to be serving something on the school level and not be completing the circle and educating the parents and, and sending information home or an e-newsletter that says, this is what we're doing. Take a minute to ask your child, did they like the taste of this? And there's no right answer, right? Like right. You, you can not like it. That's totally fine too, but it's just that relationship with food and knowing um, and I'm an, I'm an eighties baby. And, um, I can tell you, I grew up in the quick and fast microwave dinner <laughs> pouch of, um, a lemonade dump in the water. You know, yeah. it was, everything was we, and I mean, I, as a parent, you know, moving into that space and, you know, with my job now, obviously I I'm involved with, um, nutrition and food on a daily basis, but, I, I know I, I, it's hard if you don't, if you grew up in a way where you did not eat certain things and it, you're, it's foreign. And as parents, you're, you're living a stressful, busy life as it is. So sometimes those things can be intimidating um, to try new things, even as adults. Yeah. And I think that that's where like in the, in the cafeteria setting, whether it's a try it Tuesday or, or something new on the menu, we do a lot of special events in, in the month of March, we eat our way through the alphabet. We do fruits and vegetables, um, A through Z. So on March 1st, we're doing asparagus and arugula and apples, which kids are, you know, most kids are familiar with apples, but a lot of kids haven't tried asparagus or arugula. So we work our way gradually through the alphabet, fruits and vegetables only, except for Q when we 
throw some quinoa in. Um, but then ending on the end of March with Z for zucchini. And then we provide families with nutrition information and they can follow along. And I think partly because it's a month long event, partly because we're providing lots mm -hmm. of information on our social channels for families to follow along with. Uh, it just kind of reinforces it. And then families can say, oh, well, we'll do it at home too. And we do little bingo, kind of bingo cards. So kids right. can keep track of what they tried, what was different. You know, did they like it? Did they not? And just really those conversations are so important about, you know, we always like to say, don't yuck my yum, you know, when we're doing something in a classroom. And then really teaching children to talk about you know, well, I didn't like that because it was too spicy. It was too sour. It was too sweet or, you know, really putting some language around why they didn't like it and then having them kind of problem solve, like, well, what could make it better for you? Like maybe we make it less spicy or more spicy. Things right. Like that. That's yeah. interesting. So, okay. Common misnomer. I feel like, especially probably a lot of parents from my generation I if you ask me about my school lunch it was I will instantly say turkey supreme because we had turkey supreme every single Thursday <laughs> and every <laughs> single Friday we had square pizzas that were not great so I've I've had conversations with parents and even really people within the food industry and they'll say, oh, school lunch, like yeah. no one. Yeah. So I, it seems like you at, within your district, you have an amazing setup. And I don't I obviously I can't speak for all the districts across the U.S. But what would you say about, I guess, a general um, feedback on that or thoughts on that? I think everyone tends to rely on their own experience like you just did you yeah. just said you know when I grew up in the 80s and this was my experience with school lunch and I grew up in the 70s and this was my experience with school lunch I did not want to eat school lunch. no with my own children even growing up in the late 80s and 90s you know it wasn't even about the food but culture in the cafeteria that made them not want to eat school lunch um, but I think everyone always relies on their own memories of what they experienced in a school lunch program or in a school cafeteria you know, whether it was um, a family who qualified for free or reduced price meals and they had to have that. have a different colored <laughs> ticket. Yes, that, that was traumatizing. You. That was Absolutely. so traumatizing. Absolutely. <laughs> um, or the square pizza yeah. or, um, you know, going back farther, like to my era, like the little bologna cups that they like fried bologna until it <laughs> turned into a cup. I never ate that. In fact, <laughs> I never e actually even saw that being served in a school lunch program. But, you know, there's the stories like yes. what you heard, what you experienced is what every parent relies on for their frame of reference. So I always want to tell parents that they need to, you know, this isn't your father's, you know, that, that, that saying like, this isn't your father's whatever car, right. this isn't, you know, things are changing. School nutrition programs are changing. Um, change started long before the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010, but that was a real catalyst moment for school nutrition programs. So where things started to change, schools started to incorporate many, many more whole grains so that m most, the majority or all of the grains that they serve are whole grain rich. Um, fruits and vegetables became you know, a requirement and, and a lot, serving a lot of fruits and vegetables. Salad bars are now um, common in many, many school lunch programs. What I tell parents and grandparents, because many times children are, you know, children are being cared for by their grandparents, um, is to have a conversation with the school nutrition program. Do a little reconnaissance, you know, talk to the school nutrition director, visit the cafeteria, pay attention to the menus. Um, many schools have a social media presence. And, you know, if you can follow your school nutrition program on Instagram or, or on Facebook, um, Many times they're showing pictures of what's being served in the cafeteria and you might be surprised um, because more and more schools are relying on moving to towards more scratch cooking, um, preparing fresh fruits and vegetables versus canned or frozen. Not that there's anything wrong with frozen vegetables, but um, 
children tend to like crunchy, fresh vegetables better. So if we are trying to um, encourage children to be adventuresome eaters, you know, really these wide variety salad bars that are allowing students to try a wide variety of foods and also select the things that they like. Um, I think school lunch should not just be written off. I think parents do need to find out what's happening in their own community and they might just be surprised at the wide variety of choices of fresh fruits and vegetables that are being offered of the whole grains. You know, um, I'll be honest, we still serve chicken nuggets. Um, they're not on our menu every week. They are in our cycle once uh, every six weeks. Um, and they are probably one of our most popular menu items. However, we try to source the best chicken nugget that we can. Right. Um, it's got a whole grain coating. We're trying to find whole, you know, chicken nuggets that are made with whole muscle chicken versus chicken that's been formed into that nugget shape. Um, I just think families need to, before they form an opinion, this goes about everything, but yes. before they form an opinion, really make sure that they know what is happening in their own community and in their own district. And if they're not comfortable with that, if they're not, if they don't like what they see, have some conversations because change doesn't happen by waving a magic wand. Change takes a long time um, and it takes a lot of hands and, you know, respectfully say, how can we get a salad bar into our program so our kids have this wide variety of choices of fruits and vegetables? Or how could we get some more culturally appropriate meals? And you know, have that conversation with the school nutrition director in an open and honest and collaborative way so that, um, so change can happen. Yeah, that's when you say the culturally inclusive, I think that's what the, but that's where I'm, I automatically went because I'm here in, in Orlando, we have a large Hispanic population and um, it's, it's sometimes hard to move from this is what I've had and this is all I know to like way over here, you know? So if there's ways um, to look at your, I guess, population and understand, I'm sure just from my perspective, it could alleviate also food waste, you know, understanding like, hey, we can incorporate the fruits and vegetables, but how can we do that with this traditional whatever dish right. of sorts, you right. know? Right, and often- there, you can reach out into the community. There's grants available and there, there are community members who are willing to share their expertise in, um, we have in Portland, we have a high, which is a, a, a district that's right next door to me, Portland, Maine. We have a high um, population of Somalian and other immigrants from the, Cong the Congo and um, different areas of Africa. And there are, there's, a woman who's very skilled in preparing that type of food in Portland got a grant to work with his school nutrition chef. And this woman who's very wow. skilled at her native cuisine and bringing together and then making these recipes that are school nutrition appropriate for the guidelines that we have to follow, you know, the sodium standards that we have to follow and, you know, making sure that they're not too high in fat and, and sugar and things like that. And then putting those men, those recipes that they developed together on the menu, um, which made everyone feel wonderful. It, it, it gave the children who aren't from those communities an opportunity to experience the culture of right. their classmates. Um, it gave the classmates who have just come here from Somalia and Congo, uh, opportunity to eat cuisine that tasted like home to them. And it really was a wonderful experience for all. And that those recipes then became part of their menu cycle so that they show up on the menu quite right. regularly. That's such a great story. Well, so as a parent, and you touched on this a little bit, and I guess checking out the social media to understand what's on the menu and diving in a little bit deeper before we go off of the Turkey Supreme experiences. <laughs> yeah. um, how would you suggest, so a parent wanting to, a busy parent also, well, but I think yeah. all parents are busy. <laughs> Most parents are busy. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, um, with first steps in maybe making a change or offering up, 
I don't know, getting, just getting involved. If they see that, oh gosh, I, I, you know, this doesn't seem, we need to make some changes here. What could be first steps for a parent to get involved? Who would they reach out to, I guess? I think the first thing to do would be to, you know, make sure that they're aware of the menu at their child's school. And those are posted online. Sometimes they still come home, whatever. And then getting a list of who the contact people are. And that also would be on the district website. Uh, You know, who the kitchen manager is at their child's school may be a first place to start. But the school nutrition director, I mean, it it truly depends on the size of the district. We're a small district. We're 3,300 students. um, And, but across the country, because I know you have listeners from all across the country, um, 75% of the districts in this country are small districts are are like 5,000 students or less. Um, contact, you know, whoever, you know, start with the school nutrition director, they may be able to say, well, you know, these, those decisions, the menu isn't being planned at this level. However, we have a dietitian working in this office, like in a very large district, and I'm going to put you in contact with them. I think approaching it with, you know, like we very open-mindedly because an understanding that we have guidelines that we must follow. Right. That's we what are I was following say that. Yes. <laughs> a program that is um, our guidelines are written by the units by the USDA. And then yeah. we must follow those guidelines. Um, we, and making sure that you understand that, you know, if we are serving, for instance, I, you know, I just referenced a chicken nugget. It's not the same chicken nugget that you're going to get at your local quick serve restaurant. Right. This chicken nugget that we're serving is more than likely developed for a school nutrition program. It is going to be lower in um, lower in sodium. It's going to have a whole grain breading versus a regular breading. It's going to have lower in fat, and it's going to be baked in an oven versus fried in a friolator. That doesn't mean that you still want to eat those every day and, and right. we don't serve them every day, but it's not the same product. Even the cereals that we serve are cereals that are formulated for, for, for school use. They are not the same cereals that are sold on the grocery store shelves. Um, so they're lower in sugar. Again, they're lower in sugar. They formulate these cereals to be um, meet the guidelines. I mean, there's not any, currently not any sugar guidelines, right. but they're coming. Um, we, ex- yeah. you know, there are certainly proposed guidelines at this point that there are going to be some sugar restrictions or, or, or benchmarks to meet um, at, at breakfast in particular. And so the cereals that we're serving already are meeting a lot of those benchmarks where you might buy a cereal at the grocery store that might be 12 grams of sugar per serving. Ours are six in general, six or so. So it's not even this, even, even if it has the same name, it's not the same. So that's really interesting. I had no idea uh, yeah. that that was, I know I, I've been down a little bit of the path um, of the different uh, guidelines mm-hmm. that have to be met, especially with us, we're, with Healthy Family Project, we work with a lot of produce companies and um, they've shared, you know, I don't want to say frustration, but there's a lot of th- a lot of steps that they need to take as far as how they provide their product to schools. And so yeah. I don't think I realized that that was the same, that there were guidelines with cereals and things like that. As yeah, well. it's, it is kind of interesting. And I know a lot of families don't understand that I'll get emails like, why are you serving this cereal? And I, and I just have to sh- take a picture of the label and say, this right. isn't the same cereal. Even it has wow. the same name as what you're buying at the grocery store and what you can buy at the grocery store. It's not the same. Um, and I think just, I think a, a parents need to, you know, kind of accustom themselves to what or inform themselves about what our guidelines are. Um, and then really just approach the school nutrition director open-mindedly and say, you know, what, how can we help? How can we um, support you into moving more towards scratch cooking? Um, Because that's really kind of a hot button issue right now, but it also gives you way more control over the sodium, the sugar and things like that in your menus. Um, And it's not, um, it's a really very slow step-by-step approach, but um, with family support, I think it's really great. 
a, a, you know, family, somebody in the community might be really skilled at, um, you know, social media may offer to come in and take some pictures so that you can, you know, upgrade your Facebook page or your website. Um, there may be dietitians in the community who could volunteer, you know, there are not every district has a dietitian or a dietetic right. technician working in their school nutrition program. There may be dietitians in the community who might want to work it as a project or interns um, who are um, working towards becoming a registered dietitian who could um, do a rotation through a school nutrition program and help develop some recipes that might work that, you know, to make things um, more scratch cooked, um, more whole, wholesome, less relying on, you know, that old um, freezer or bag to yes. oven or steam table <laughs> um, type of type of approach. I know one thing with my own kids, um, they go back and forth. They'll, they'll eat school lunch and then my dad always packed. Well, my dad packed my lunch some days. I ate school lunch some days, but I, um, that was like a special thing. He worked long hours. So for him, he'd write me little notes and it was, it was more than just what was packed in the lunch. You know, it was part of our relationship. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of carried that on a little bit with my girls because I really associate that back to my dad. And I think, and I write them little notes. And of course I go over the top with my bento boxes and things like that. So I may have spoiled them a little bit in that regard, <laughs> but yeah. over the past couple of years, I have encouraged them, um, especially learning more about the school district that we are in, which is Orange County Public Schools in um, mm -hmm. Orlando, which is a huge school district. Right. Um, but I have toured um, many of their kitchens and, uh, you know, their gardens and just, you know, we have great ag programs at a lot of the high schools. And so um, I've started over the past couple of years saying, yeah, you got to eat school lunch. Like we're in a great district we have great options that you know but when they get home I will make a mental note to just ask oh what did you pick like what did you right. eat today like to continue that conversation and I think that's an easy dinner conversation or even driving to a sport after school or whatever it might be just to say what did you eat today? What did you pick out? Or, you know, those, I like to have those converse, conversations around food because the recipes and the taste and everything, that's one thing, but the relationship with food is something that I feel like goes hand in hand with how you live, I guess. I don't know if you can agree to that. I think it's more, it's, there's that relationship and you have to have a healthy relationship with food in order to I don't know. Sure. Be successful. Yeah. <laughs> we, we always say, you know, it's school, the school, our staff, our cafeterias are kind of a no judgment zone. And so students, when they're in their classroom, you know, the teachers need things from them. They have homework, they have expectations and, you know, it can be, school can be a really stressful place these days. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> but when they come in, so in, in Maine, all school meals are free for all students. So um, we feel like it is a, you know, just this place where we can feed kids, you know, we're not asking them for anything. We're just feeding them. We may nudge them to remember to take their fruit or vegetable because right. that's actually a requirement, but you know, you need to take fruit or vegetable, but look at all these options that you have. You have right. five or six choices on the salad bar today. Um, but it's really kind of a safe space for students often where we're just feeding them. And by that, we're also, you know, just checking in with them. We're also in the school, some of the only people that see all students, you know, we see every kid that is getting a school meal is coming through one of our lines and, you know, they, in no one else in the building is seeing all the students. And so it's a great, we build really wonderful relationships with students, with students and um, it's great to have them interact with our team and really become trusted people. And then, you know, a lot of the things that we do between 
our the, some of the cooking events that we do and the social media that we have and the newsletters and recipes that we send home and our school gardens, we feel like we're building bridges with the families. So it becomes a circle of trust that we have yes. with families. Families have learned to trust us to feed their children well, and students have learned to trust us. Um, and we really feel like it's an important thing that we're doing, influencing families' eating habits, not just children's eating habits. But um, And we hope and believe that as these children move off into college and to become their own um, adults, that they will take some of the eating habits that they learned in school and take them into the community. And hopefully that will influence a better generation of eaters. That's the goal, right? It is. That, that is the goal. Yeah. <laughs> My 17 year old, um, I think I, and I've said this for years with her that I, my goal is that she, when she leaves this house, that she can be comfortable in the kitchen and that she can be comfortable in a grocery store picking different things. And she can feel confident and not intimidated or stressed or afraid when it comes to food or looking at food as this is good and this is bad. Like there's not, I mean, obviously there's foods that are better for all of us, but just understanding and not having that, that feeling, you know, of this is good and this is not good. This is bad. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've always associated, which I think is works really well with, with kids is this is brain power. Like, Oh, you have a big test today. Let's make sure you, let's make this smoothie. You know, that's because my, both of mine want to get out the door in the morning and they don't really, they're, really especially because they're both teenagers now they don't necessarily want to eat first thing and it kills right. me because right. <laughs> I want them to eat a nutritious right, breakfast right, right. that doesn't come <laughs> along with being a dietitian that's not the messaging we give people right yeah exactly so ah uh, you know it's a struggle it's it's it, I mean I shouldn't put a negative connotation on on it I think that like I said it, as long as they can the goal is to create a healthier generation, you know, to create that relationship with food. And hopefully our society down the road will not, you know, maybe face the health issues that we face today. It would be, you know, a hope, I think. Well, yeah, I I agree. That is certainly one of the huge goals of school nutrition is to really create healthier, you know, by feeding children well through their childhood. Um, and ensuring that they have all, that all children have access to healthy school breakfast, healthy school lunch, you know, well-balanced meals, um, that they, that we start to eliminate some of these health problems that are showing up earlier and earlier and earlier. Yes. Well, maybe I should have your mom on the podcast next and she's (laughs) going to be 100 years old. Maybe she can weigh in on what she's been eating. (laughs) (laughs) Well, she is, you know, she has always been very um, thoughtful about what she ate and that she ate well and that she, you know, got a lot of physical activity. She never was, you know, a runner or anything like that, but she was always mindful of her physical activity and the food that went into her mouth and she wasn't restrictive. She, you know, if she wanted that cookie or a piece of cake, she would eat it, you know? Right. And now whatever goes, anything goes <laughs> now when you're almost a hundred. But yeah. I think she had a really very healthy relationship with food and with exercise so that, you know, the goal was to be healthy. And I think that that's really, a, you know, a, a wonderful goal is to, you know, eat right and be active to be healthy, but not to be so restrictive that you can't enjoy an occasional treat, right. you know, um, but you know, not make those treats an everyday thing. I think that that's one of the things that has changed so recently is that treats, you know, like we used to have soda when I was growing up on one day a week, like soda and popcorn on Sunday afternoons, you know, but now soda has become kind of a regular supply in people's refrigerators. And, you know, that I think that that is when it became a problem. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been so wonderful to have this conversation with you. I think that our listeners have a lot to to take take away with. And if or if anyone wants to, I always ask this if there's a way to 
either connect with you or follow along with your school as an example? Is there social media or somewhere that someone could go? Sure, sure. Our our Facebook page is lunch is Wyndham Raymond Schools, Wyndham Raymond School Nutrition Program. That's on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And okay. on Instagram, we're lunch for kids RSU14. Okay. And we can link up to those in the show notes mm-hmm. too. So okay, that way that anyone great. anyone listening then We'll have those links and maybe we can share um, a few more links for anybody that wants to get more involved in school lunches. And yeah, this has been great. Um, This is wonderful. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really glad. I hope families will give their school lunch program a try, but I also hope that they'll, you know, really become partners with their school nutrition program and, and collaboratively, you know, if they really are hoping for change, that they'll approach it collaboratively so that, you know, and so that that change can happen, but in a positive way. And so that people, people, school nutrition programs, kitchens, they need, they need the equipment, they need the skills. So all of those things need to be in place. And that may be something that families don't necessarily understand the skill level, the equipment in the kitchen. Um, the guidelines, as we've talked about, you know, all of those things need to be in place, but that might be a place where a parent can help out. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much.